Welcome back for another installment of our Theology Thursdays. I've been enjoying this. And today we're going to look at a paradigm shift that all of the disciples had simultaneously. We're going to go to John chapter 4. And hopefully for us, we experience a paradigm shift as well. Uh, it says this. Now, Jesus is talking to a woman at the well. We know her as the Samaritan woman. And let me just stop before we even get into the passage and say that this woman has gotten beat up by the church. All right. We preach and teach about this woman and we get a lot of the facts wrong. Now, the passage says that she's had multiple husbands and the man she's living with now is not her husband. Now, we take that to mean she's got a shameful reputation. We take that to mean she's some sort of shady woman. And um, I'm sorry, but we butcher this passage when it comes to this woman. Let me tell you this. In, in Jesus' culture, in the first century, women had no legal rights, which meant a woman could not divorce a man. What's most likely happening is that her husbands keep dying. Now, if you reverse, go all the way back to the book of Ruth, okay? What you'll see is that when a husband dies, the wife, the, the widow, has to then look for a kinsman redeemer. We see this a couple of times throughout the Bible. Because women were not financially or legally or socially in a predicament to be single or to be unmarried meant to be unprotected and unprovided for. So to even think, to even fathom that this woman is just like, I don't know, to read about this woman with a 21st century lens is to really like... I mean, we're culturally massacring this text. And, and I've heard so many sermons in churches where, you know, they're kind of like, yeah, you know, she was a shameful. That, the text doesn't say that at all. Not at all. Nowhere does the text suggest that this woman has any kind of sketchy past. If anything, the woman's husbands keep dying. And, you know, literally a brother or an uncle or whoever, the closest kinsman redeemer keeps, um, keeps taking her as a wife. And now she's just in a situation where probably the closest of kin has taken her in and won't marry the woman. That doesn't mean that anything sexual is happening between uh, her and this man that she's living with. Um, again, if you read, even in the Old Testament, about Tamar, right? She marries Judah's son, he dies, and, and Judah's reluctant to give her the next son, right? This is, so this could totally be a scenario in which the woman um, has nothing sketchy happening, but that the current kinsman redeemer just doesn't want to marry her because her previous five husbands have all croaked on her. You know what I mean? This is, I mean, in a superstitious culture, I could totally see how this is not an example of cohabitation. This is an example of a patriarchal culture, a patriarchal society, and this woman's options are very, very limited. So here we go. Enters Jesus, okay? Jesus starts talking to the woman, and I want to draw our attention to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, and we're going to go to verse 27. Jesus and the woman have had a quite a long conversation, a very theological conversation, mind you. And it says this, just then Jesus' disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one, and I'm inserting some words here, but no one had the courage to ask. What do you want or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ, the anointed one or the Messiah? And they came out of the town and made their way towards him. Um, so 
I want to draw our attention to the disciples because the disciples are the ones that get, they're getting a massive paradigm shift. Just then, his disciples returned and were shocked, surprised. I mean, couldn't believe it. Couldn't believe their eyes because no rabbi in the first century would have taken the time to talk to a woman, to entertain her theological questions, to minister one-on-one -on -one to a woman. They were shocked. And to be quite honest, I'm not shocked that they were shocked because they were living in the middle of one of the most patriarchal cultures on the planet. Now, this, this, this theme in John's gospel reaches a climax when Jesus dies and the boys, that's right, all those male disciples are scared, shook, hiding, literally closed behind locked doors. But who goes to anoint Jesus' body? That's right, Mary Magdalene. When all the boys are scared, one woman has the courage to actually care more for the body of Jesus than her own safety. And Mary Magdalene goes to the garden tomb looking for Jesus. And <laughs> on Easter morning, the first Easter, on Resurrection Sunday, she encounters the resurrected Jesus. And what does Jesus say? He says, hey, tell the boys I'm alive, which makes Mary Magdalene the first official communicator of the resurrected Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now this is not coincidental. This is very, very, very um, in line and consistent with not just John's agenda, but with God's agenda and Jesus' agenda. And what is that agenda? That agenda is the radical liberation of one group of people who were consistently oppressed throughout the Bible, and that would be women. Hey, wanted to take a time out because topics like women in ministry and feminism are really, really sensitive, delicate topics. And we could only get into a surface level conversation here on Theology Thursdays, but me and Aaron are both feminists. And me and Aaron both dive really, really deep into this topic, especially on my course on the book of John, Systematic Theology, and we have a whole 60 minute conversation where we talk about women being in ministry. Because if you're female and you know how to preach we need you in the ministry so how about this how about you go to armorcourses.com right now and become a part of our tribe our family arma needs you and you need arma so let's do it okay come on back to the video bye now paul picks up right where jesus leaves off i mean paul does not revert now, you may read some of these household codes or some of the things that Paul says about women being silent in church, and I promise you that maybe one Thursday we'll do just an episode on those passages because we have really done a bad job interpreting those passages. However, if we go to Romans chapter 16, and I've got my streamer right in Romans chapter 16, Jesus absolutely elevates the role of women. He does it with the Samaritan woman. He does it again with Mary Magdalene. And then Romans chapter 16 rolls around um, and it says this, I love this, um, because uh, the NIV does not translate this well, but I'm also going to read from the NRSV. Romans chapter 16 verse 1, it says this, I commend you to our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church in Cancrea. Now, <laughs> the NIV translated that as servant. The reason why the NIV translated that as servant is because still, in the year 2020, we are still oppressing women. Now, when you read that in the Greek, now I'm not a Greek expert, but the Greek word right there that the NIV translates as servant is diakonos, which means deacon. And why doesn't the NIV translate it as deacon? Even when the exact same Greek word gets used all everywhere else in the New Testament and it doesn't get translated as servant, but it gets translated as deacon, well, because the agenda of the people who were translating the NIV did not want women to be deacons or pastors or ministers or preachers or anything else. But man, we've got a woman in John chapter 4 who's 
leading her whole town to Jesus. And then we have another woman at the end of the book of John who's announcing the resurrection of Jesus. And we've got a woman who's taking Paul's letter to the Romans. That's exactly what Phoebe's role would have been to take the letter and not only read the letter, but carriers or couriers of letters actually would have performed the letter or preached the letter. But we don't want to give women too much power, so we translate it as servant instead of deacon. And I just think that's ridiculous. Now, if we continue in Romans chapter 16, uh, I hope, I hope uh, I'm rattling some cages and freeing some people who should be in ministry, but because of your gender, you think that you're not supposed to be in ministry. Here we go, verse three. Greet Priscilla and Aquila. Now let's just hold on right there. You mean to tell me the wife is mentioned first? Yes, Priscilla is named before her husband Aquila. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. Uh, the NRSV says, my co-workers, my co-laborers. And it gets better. Verse 7 of Romans chapter 16, it says this. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my relatives who have been in prison with me. They are outstanding among the apostles. And they were in Christ before I was. So we get a woman that's a Samaritan woman who's clearly preaching the gospel. We get a woman named Mary Magdalene who's clearly announcing the resurrection of Jesus. We get a woman named Phoebe who's clearly a deacon. We get a woman named Priscilla who's a co-laborer with Paul and is named before her husband. And then, and then we get Junia who's named as an apostle. And why can't women preach? Why do we oppress women? I really don't know. And I hope that this is a paradigm shifting moment for you. Maybe you've read passages in Timothy or Ephesians or elsewhere that have talked about the submission of women or that have talked about women being silent in the churches. I promise you, that when you study historical context, you'll realize there was good reason for Paul to say those things and that they are not binding and that they don't contradict what Paul sells, says elsewhere. Here's one more radical passage for you. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I want to read something that's very, very radical, but I don't think we, especially in American culture, see it as radical, but it is. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 4. The wife's body does not belong to her alone, but also to her husband. Amen. Here we go. What does Paul say next? In the same way, the husband's body does not belong to him alone, but also to his wife. And at that point, everyone reading the letter would have went, oh, what? what? Paul, the husband's body doesn't belong to him alone, but to the wife. In Greco-Roman society, a husband was known to have mistresses. There was a sexual double standard. Everyone knew that the wife's body belonged to the husband, but no one would have dared to write that the husband's body belonged to the wife. It was normal to go to the temple and sleep with temple prostitutes, to have mistresses, to actually have concubines. I mean, Greco-Roman culture was filled, I mean filled, with a double standard when it came to the wife's uh, sexual conduct versus the man's sexual conduct. And Paul has the audacity to say, no, hey husband, I know nobody else has the courage to tell you this, but your body belongs to your wife. Now we don't see that as radical, but we aren't the recipients of these letters or these manuscripts or these books. The Bible was written to, for us, but not to us. And we've got to uncover the original message to the original audience. And I'm telling you that when they opened up Corinthians and they saw that Paul was telling husbands, husbands, the heads of homes who had the right to do whatever they wanted to do, that their bodies belonged to their wives, they would have had a massive paradigm shift. So when it comes to gender, 
gender inclusion, gender equality, when it comes to women in ministry, we've got to have a massive paradigm shift. The same way the disciples were shocked to see Jesus talking to a woman. We may be shocked to see the Holy Spirit anointing women, calling women in a ministry, commissioning women to, um, to preach, to teach. And I'm all for it. I'm all for women in ministry. Um, and I hope that if you are a woman and you're watching this uh, Theology Thursday, that this helps you to feel free to pursue your call with the exact same veracity and with the exact same passion that any man would pursue their call. Hey, till next Thursday, I love you. I hope that you enjoyed this installment of our Theology Thursday. Peace.